And there is also a bodily resurrection of the wicked. Theirs isn't a resurrection of grace. Theirs is a, resur a resurrection of condemnation and shame. And they will be ashamed, covered in it, when they're raised. And their body too will be fitted for the place that God has for them, for everlasting wrath in the lake of fire. As is the dwelling place for eternity, so will be the body and soul appropriately fitted. And this means that all those outside of Christ must repent and believe, because that's what awaits those who live and die in sin. And Lord's Day 22 has a different thrust, however, it deals with the comfort of the believer, so the punishment of the unbeliever is not its focus. And in fact, 1 Corinthians 15 is similar. And in general, the Bible speaks more about what happens to the believer after death than it does about the unbeliever. That's the major plot, as it were. And what about this chapter itself, 1 Corinthians 15, the greatest chapter in the Bible on the general resurrection. And it makes at least three main points. It makes an awful lot more, but at least three main points. First of all, it makes the point that in order to understand the, re the general resurrection, you need to grasp that there is an inseparable connection between Christ's resurrection and ours. If you think about it, just at the end of the world, all these bodies are going to rise. You haven't got it. All the bodies will rise, now thinking of believers, because that's the idea, because those bodies are inseparably joined to Christ. I'm joined to Christ by faith, and I am body and soul, my body and my soul, inseparably joined to Christ, and Christ will not rest until at the end of the world, all the bodies, as well as the souls, of believers are glorified and united. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And the surrounding verses use the image of the first fruits, an agricultural picture. The first fruits being the guarantee security for the rest of the harvest and since Christ the first fruits has risen from the dead all those that are part of the same harvest with him and united to him will be raised and if Christ is not risen then we won't rise and if Christ is risen we will most certainly rise from the dead then second the apostle uses one special image for the resurrection and it's a very simple one children can easily grasp this it's a seed you put a seed into the ground it sprouts it grows it has to go into the ground though and after a time you see it again for a while though you don't but then up it comes and that's the main idea with the laying of a coffin in the grave. That's what happens at a funeral. We sow a seed. And one day, that seed, along with all the other seeds of believers, different sort of seed of believer now than we usually talk about, will, raise, will be raised from that graveyard and in thousands of graveyards like it all around the world. And then at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, this great chapter on the general resurrection, the apostle, as it were, takes us through the day itself, the resurrection morn, although it could be an evening for all we know, but it's more often spoken of in that terminology. Verses 51 to 57, here we have what's called the rapture is spoken of when those who are alive will be <clears throat> transformed, glorified, without passing through death. 
but we're especially interested in the resurrection of those who were already dead. Events in this sequence, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised. Raised in incorruptible and immortal bodies. Immortal bodies means bodies which can never die again. And incorruptible means they don't corrupt. You can't get sick in this body. You can't injure yourself in this body. And at that time comes the final ignominious defeat of death. Death is swallowed up in victory. The victory of the resurrection. Which is a victory over death which has reigned for 6,000 years. A victory over sin and a victory over the law as the instrument of God to condemn sin and a victory over Satan. The victory of the resurrection. That puts an end to all the enemies. Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 57. So what is the practical application of this truth of the general resurrection? What calling comes to the believer from this biblical teaching? What does 1 Corinthians 15 say? The great chapter on the general resurrection. Well, it has certain things to say in this connection. Verse 33, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Some people are very apt to be fooled here that if they keep bad company, that is company with ungodly people, and they spout their own thoughts, then your good manners or habits will be corrupted. It's a scriptural principle. You don't spend time with someone who's ungodly and escape scot-free. The difference, of course, in marriage, there's a special preserving grace there, or at work where you have that to do. We're talking now about fellowships, friendships, unequal yokes in other fields. Evil communications do corrupt good manners. Be not deceived, because people are frequently deceived. Think, well, it won't affect me. Well, God says it does. In the next verse, 34, awake to righteousness and sin not. Get with it. Some of you in the church are very sleepy, lost all moral sensitivity. Some of you don't seem to know anything about God. I speak this to your shame. But the main exhortation in 1 Corinthians 15 comes in the very last verse of the chapter beginning with the word therefore that is on the basis of all which we've seen about the general resurrection therefore my beloved brethren be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain on the basis of the previous 57 verses therefore steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And the work of the Lord here refers to the work of Christ, who in the New Testament is generally the one addressed as Lord. The work of the Lord is what Christ does. The work of the Lord here is first of all his work of defeating death, because he defeated sin. He defeats to the grave. And more broadly, the work of Christ is his life of righteousness, issuing in his satisfaction for our sins by taking our place, and then sealing this by his own resurrection. And the Lord Jesus has this work in his own lifetime, in his work of humiliation, but the work of Jesus Christ continues throughout the New Testament age. And believers are told to be steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. 